as we began, there, we realized we had courses and numerous courses online and hybrid courses, but what we didn't have was the infrastructure to support those courses. And what I mean by that is student support, extended faculty support, and even helping the trainers understand what's involved in the conceptualization of an online course and using the framework of the learning management system. So we've now reached out to all the student support services areas on campus to inform them, to work with them, to, to create an orientation for students on campus. We've also designed an online orientation for those students who may be visiting students or just taking an online course for the first time for the adult learner. With that online orientation, we also ask faculty to take a look at that course. It's a good way for them to see what it's like to be an online student and maybe familiarize themselves with all the different learning features. In terms of faculty support, we realized we're a small operation on campus. What can we do to help the faculty when we're not there? We looked to SUNY for that, and we've gotten the SUNY Help Desk, the extended hours for weeknights and weekends, and that has been really just a plus, adding to what we're able to do for the faculty who want the one-on-one -on -one and, <coughs> excuse me, to see us on campus. They now are also able to go to SUNY for help. We offer trainings. We make it available day, evening, weekend. One-on-one, -on -one, workshops, and we're looking at doing a self-paced online course as well. We're also looking at an online orientation for faculty. For the new faculty, we have a new faculty orientation course. So every time uh, somebody brand new comes in to teach with us, they get placed into this course. The course teaches them the basics, um, so you know a little bit of the LMS, but a lot also on how do you teach in the online environment. So we're talking about um, having teaching presence, social presence, making sure that they're actively engaged and involved. Because we use a master course model, we also have to talk about things like how do you personalize your course? How do you go through the course and make sure that you're, you first understand what it is that has been built into that course and what you might need to do to adapt it to make sure that you're connected to the content and that you're able to then teach that content to the students and be there for them. Uh, communication is huge, so we have things like how do you post announcements and make sure that you're doing that frequently so that students see that you're there and you're present in your online course. Um, because again, we know that the research tells us that that is critical for a student to stay engaged and to do well. They need to know that that instructor is there for them. So, you, so in the online environment, you have to spend, a, I'm going to say, quite a bit of time making sure that, that your students are seeing you there. Um, so in, in addition to being able to do things like post announcements, you can post welcome videos, you can post uh, um, chat times. You know, there's all sorts of different ways that you can approach making sure that you're present in your online course. So uh, our trainings will cover those sort of things as well. That's just the training that we have for new instructors. We also have a space, a uh, faculty resource space, for everybody. So if you've been teaching with us for a while, you've always got access to those same materials. You don't lose them. You can come back to them. And whenever things are updated, you're going to get a notification that, hey, there's this new piece of information. So here's something else that we've learned that we're now sharing with you. So we do a lot of that. Um, we're, because of our uniqueness with the master course model, we also have to make sure that our developers are trained. So we have some people who might, they might just come in and do a course development, or we might have instructors who teach but don't ever develop. So we have two separate paths. So for those, for those faculty that are coming in to develop a course, we also have training developed for them and they learn about how to do some basic instructional design, how what, they learn about adult learners. Um, the average age, age of our student is 36, so it's really important that they understand adult learning theory. They learn about a uh, little bit about this, the LMS and they also learn about a uh, little bit about accessibility, copyright, uh, but they also always have an instructional designer with them through that course development process. So, there's a, so, th so that course is a little bit um, shorter than say the course for those who are teaching. Um, we also do a lot of workshops and webinars for our instructors so that they can continue to be, you know, learn about different techniques and how to retain and to engage their students. We have the faculty examine what is going to be their instructor student connection. How are they going to interact? How are they going to give feedback? Are they going to use the phone? 
virtual office hours? Are they going to be have a presence in the discussion forum? So that's how we talk about the instructor presence and connection with the students. We have to have the student to student connection. And so are they using discussion forums, the chat room, group projects, peer review? And then what, and this is really critical, the student to content interaction. Because the whole point of this is to take advantage of the web. And we want to promote active learning. So it's not just taking quizzes and tests, it's using the environment to, to create, to produce. So that's one form, well, three types of connections. But we're also talking about, if you're not teaching online, using the learning management system. And that's a way of connecting in the face-to-face -face classroom. It's a consulting engagement. You know, one of the things that I think we've distinguished between is the fact that what we do is truly professional development. I don't think we ever, ever, ever want to use the words training. Because to me, training has a very negative connotation. It means at the end of the day, I've taught you to do some set of skills that you'll probably forget the moment you walk out the door. What we're really doing is we're, at the core of it, trying to create transformation in someone's teaching practice. And I think we're very upfront about that. We acknowledge that they are probably very excellent in the classroom, but what we're asking them to do is something totally different from what they've done before. This isn't simple replication, taking into some other domain and doing the same thing. It's thinking differently. And asking faculty to think differently about something they've been doing for a very, very long time is often an incredibly positive transforming event for the faculty. It's probably something they haven't had time to sit down and think about what their teaching practice looks like because of all their responsibilities that they carry day to day as a faculty member. So bringing them out, maybe with a course they've taught for many, many years, and asking them to really rethink, what is this course about? What are learners supposed to be able to do at the end of this course? What is my role in facilitating learning now that I am not the sage on the stage? Those are the ways we frame that engagement. And faculty find it such a great opportunity for reflection that I think via word of mouth, uh, we attract new clientele, we attract new faculty. A few years ago, we redesigned our faculty development program. Um, one of the things is we, 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 we saw some gaps. Um, in our program and in the program that was being offered to our faculty. Um, we, we wanted to also give them uh, some kind of grounding element, a moniker that they could think of. Uh, so we talked about this being almost like a, a double helix in that we teach them about um, both the technology as well as the pedagogy. And we redesigned it in a way that um, if you're familiar with Spiral Curriculum, you can start um, and teach them something at a very um, kind of base, uh, base level. Teach them a little bit of pedagogy at a real base level relative to students, um, things like um, lecturing, things like that. And then move on to kind of, and as you come around the cycle again, um, do that at a little bit of higher level and so on and forth. And so you end up creating this spiral curriculum where you continually grow and, and add to that um, uh, the, um, the experience and expand their knowledge base. And we do the same thing with the technology. So we look at uh, introducing a topic um, and not going full on with a particular topic like online discussions. Introduce the online discussion to them and then bring them back a month later or two and then talk about other aspects of online discussions. And so it ends up creating this a double spiral or a double helix. And a few years ago, we designed it that way and we used that imagery to help people understand, um, help faculty understand what it is that um, learning how to teach online um, was like. And so that they can understand that in, in something that perhaps they've come, ac we come across in, in the past, that we would have this spiral. Because most of the faculty that come to us don't really know about spiral curriculum. They don't have a grounding in education. So they don't really have that uh, experience. But if we talk about something from sciences that they've experienced, it, it kind of makes sense to them. Um, we've 
since then added additional pieces to it, um, brought in pieces from the library and, um, and multimedia, and also um, universal design, adding pieces there as well. So kind of the, the core of the faculty development is this double helix where we teach technology intertwined with the, the pedagogy, and we kind of bring those up together at the same time, and then bring in other aspects um, so that um, you know, as the time goes on, uh, as they begin building their, their course. Um, and that's kind of the core and essence of the faculty development program. As an example of one of the spirals, uh, we, uh, you, I'll, I'll use the an online discussion as an example. So we begin by saying, okay, um, at the base level, um, an online discussion can be used to, uh, to mirror what you might do in a traditional class. A traditional um, instructor-led questioning uh, aspect of it. So instructor can ask a question um, and then you can have students respond to it and then kind of grow a discussion there. Uh, we start at that point because it's something that they're relatively familiar with and, and then they can kind of translate that to the online world. They may have not done it before or used that tool before but they are at least able to uh, make that jump and that leap. So they may build a discussion in their course as they're developing it. A month or so later, after they start to, to get comfortable with building it and designing it, then we introduce other aspects and uses for that discussion forum. So for example, it may not be instructor-led, it may be student-led. Um, it may be that um, it may be used in a um, uh, a different way, like uh, where the student is a, an expert. Maybe they, the student went out and did some of their own research in a particular area and they now become the expert. And it's an ask the expert type of situation. It may be something where we talk about group work and it, we introduce the topic of group work and, and grouping students into like or dislike groups depending on the situation of the class. But all of this is connected to what that individual instructor is trying to accomplish. We always couch it in terms of what is it you are attempting to do and what tools and vehicles are there for you. And so we continue to introduce that at a higher level. Uh, and then we talk about, so, so, there's, so we introduce the group work, we introduce uh, different aspects of how it can be used. We introduce journaling um, as, where the student can use it as, or the group can use it as a, as a mechanism for them to kind of keep track of their learning um, and uh, provide a little bit of personal insights to that learning. So we have a long list of different ways that the discussion forum can be utilized more than just a question and answer type of piece. So it's taking the technology and the pedagogy, again, it's turning them together and growing that together at the same time. So we're introducing this group work, we're introducing the journaling and the, and the insightful uh, feedback uh, mechanisms at the same time that we're saying, here's a tool and it may be used in many ways. Come in and meet with someone and just talk about it, brainstorm. Uh, what we do is we assign a faculty mentor. So after it, at our school they meet with me and we talk about the whole process, both structurally and conceptualizing. We assign a mentor and we just want to get everybody to understand, take baby steps. Just use the learning management system to make it work for you, to get you on board and then see the um, potential of doing online or using the digital environment to help you connect with your students and at the point that you would feel comfortable with. I have, through the variety of jobs I've done at the university, I've uh, managed the web team, I was in charge of domestic recruitment and first year advisement, but I've always kept sort of an ongoing mentorship thing with a, a number of students on campus, with the student union, uh, with the RLAs from the residents and a group of students that I've been working with for years. I mean, obviously they switch over, but it's this sort of side piece that I've been doing. And the university is now sort of saying, well, why don't you take that and, and broaden it a little bit? So I'm working on a variety of projects and supporting some other projects, um, trying to get to the point where students see mentorship as engagement. And that's sort of the, the model that we're working with. And so from one side of the university, I'm responsible for retention. And if you look, talk to the other side of the university, I'm responsible for engagement. Um, the way that I look at it is I'm responsible for making kids 
feel like the university experience makes sense. That's really the piece for me. And some of that has to do with talking to the faculty about the way their courses are organized and how like these two courses might work better together. Uh, some of it has to do with uh, starting new programs. I've just started a new approach to orientation week. So all these different little pieces. And the other half of that job, the strategy piece, is around academic planning. So um, the VP academic at my university is rolling out an academic plan and I'm sort of trying to coordinate that conversation with the faculty, with the administration, and also trying to design a framework that allows us to make an academic plan make sense, given the way that universities are changing and all that stuff. We also have something called an assistant area coordinator, and so that person's critically important. They're always involved in that process with the, with the instructors. We set up a, uh, we have a help email address for our instructors, and they can, they can email any question they have to that address, and they'll make sure it gets to the right person. So there's always uh, support for them. I think, and this is only personal opinion, that probably the most challenging domain to work in and be effective is indeed the university sector. Primarily because in the university sector the focus for many faculty is often not primarily on teaching. The focus can be on research. The focus can be on driving grants, on publication, on advancing the status of the institution as a research university. So finding that focus with faculty to understand what the importance is to really focus on learning, I actually did have that opportunity as a consultant uh, with a very large public land-grant institution that's well known uh, as a research university. Walking into that room and truthfully having an argument for about 20 minutes with the chair of a sciences department about why he needed to care about individual learning goals. At the end, feeling like he had agreed and he could see value in online learning uh, was, it was a huge win, but it was also a huge trust-building moment. And I think in any domain, building that trust in the faculty that I'm not going to let you fall, I'm not going to let you fail, my goal is for you and the learners to have a successful experience, regardless of the sector, uh, is paramount. So how does technology support student success specifically? And you know, here of course, we, uh, any sophisticated person in this area is going to reject the idea that, well, the kids love technology, so let's just put it in there and everything will get better. Um, the kids um, oftentimes aren't kids at all. We have a lot of non-traditional students, and the research now is showing that Traditional age students are not all um, just wildly enthusiastic about using technology, nor are they um, necessarily that skilled at doing it. Um, so I think these targeted applications that are purpose-driven are ways that support student success. Um, one of the ones we have at, at uh, Northern Arizona University um, that's been very successful is we call it the uh, GPS system. It's a grade alerting system, and it is um, a a quick for the instructor way of uh, messaging students um, with different kinds of alerts and you know you might say well why not just send them an email well there's a couple of advantages here I mean first of all um, email does tend to fill up and it may just be another message and the sea of messages that students get if I email them and say hey you, you know I looked at your midterm exam grade and we need to talk um, so that, this is one advantage is that instead of sending it into their email, it alerts them right there on their, their portal um, that they use when they log in to do really anything relating to our university. Here's this alert. And our research has shown um, at NEU that, that students are more likely to respond to those compared to, to email. Um, from the ins instructor's point of view, instead of sitting and having to type or cut and paste, I can sort my students, I can issue, um, choose some standard messages, some things that we email uh, or message students about all the time, um, and do that very quickly. And it's funny, it's kind of like Twitter in that um, there's a character limit. <laughs> so the students and the instructors know that they're not going to get some dissertation about, about an issue. They're going to get a quick targeted message that the student is likely to see. And it also goes into their advising notebook. So. You know, the student can, can go into the advisor and say, well, I, I don't know what's going on. The advisor can see, oh, well, we have these alerts from these different instructors, and here's the issues. 
So that's one example of, of kind of a purpose-driven use of technology that supports student success. Um, I think technology, uh, when it's used correctly, um, can also support things that we've found um, at NIU to be, to be important for success, such as what we call the early and often assessment philosophy. So, um, for example, courses in the first year learning initiative are required to have some kind of graded assessment in the first two weeks of class. So we picked this as kind of the sensitive period. And it's not so much that you're you know, having to do some very complex assessment of something you've taught. It's really more about sending a message to students that we get started right away, giving them feedback, um, and encouraging things like syllabus quizzes that we know help ensure that our early career students have actually seen the requirements of the course and had an opportunity to engage with that material. Well, if you don't use technology for that, that is going to be a very, very daunting task. And then it's also something that I can do throughout the, the semester. So I should also be, every week or so, having something the students can do to get some type of feedback on. Starfish is an early alert system. Um, it allows, uh, it, it creates flags for students. Um, it monitors their online progress. Um, their logins, their gradebook, all kinds of things, and uh, sends an automatic flag, um, email flag, saying, you know, we, we notice you're in some sort of trouble, here's, here's the information to get back on track, or if you need help, here's who to contact. So that happens automatically in the online environment. Our campus instructors can manually raise those flags. It's also a great survey tool. We, we send out surveys like on our athletes and our, um, our project success students, and uh, and uh, instructors can complete surveys automatically, you know, online that way pretty quickly. For online students, there's a, a no login in five days uh, alert, and um, there's another piece of that report I get that says flag cleared. So I kind of watch that, and if the flag doesn't clear in another day or two, I will probably contact that student and say, you know, we notice you haven't logged in. Is there any way I can help you get back on track? Sometimes this involves communication with the faculty. You know, I might say, you know, I see this student hasn't logged in. Do you want me to contact them on your behalf? You know, I usually pull them in if it's some really recurring um, flag that I see with a particular student. For early alert, we've been using Starfish actually for a couple of years, um, and we've, you know, it's been a honing process. But right now, we're in a really good position. Starfish has been embraced by the entire college community. Um, not just online instructors are using it, but Every instructor is now using Starfish as well as um, various groups. You know, we're monitoring our at-risk populations with it as well. Blackboard has got a lot of things in it that it can do. Some of them are quirky, some of them are clunky, um, but the stuff that it does well, the stuff that you know should be the role of every learning management system or content management system, as it as it applies here, is you know it is the place for our virtual students to live in their virtual campus. And the LMS can be used by a whole lot of things to create community especially. And that's really what it comes down to. In online learning so much, we're trying to create community. We're trying to create that, that social interaction or that social presence we talk about all the time in online learning. The LMS gives us that venue, that, that I, I call it the, the table to sit at. Um, you know, if you want to have a conversation and you want to have dinner, you've got to have a table to sit at. And you may not like your kitchen table, but it's still your kitchen table and it is the place, it ends up just being the place you're at. Um, that's how I look at the LMS. Um, so what we've done is parlay that into a, uh, a, a, a vest, not a vestibule, but, but a place to be basically for um, classes where we do all this social presence. If students are going to classes there, that's the place they have to be on campus. It is the single point of entry that students have to learn, which is why we're there. So if that's where they have to be, why not use that as, as a tool for the other pieces of campus, the non-curricular learning that happens on campus, um, the clubs, the organizations, and all of those types of things. Right now we're in a process where we're aggregating. We had a, a different product that we we're using to manage our organizations and a different product to do different things at Monroe. Right now we're in the process of aggregating them all into Blackboard. Um, when I was at Finger Lakes, we had over 200 groups and organizations inside of Blackboard. It was keeping the single point of entry. That's where people went to. Um, and I think what's nice about the implementation we have now at Monroe is that it's part of the single sign-on process through our portal. So it's just, it's just one click away for the students to get to this, 
very rich environment that they have. Um, that being said, uh, we need to make it a rich environment. It needs to be a place where people want to be. It, it's got to be attractive. Um, people like walking into new buildings. They like walking into, and going to new websites. You know, it looks nice. Um, we've got to make sure that we create that environment that's friendly and open and is usable. Uh, usability is incredibly important. Um, we don't want to have people f 15 clicks to get to their uh, chess club. You know, it needs to be pretty easy for them to see and get to. Um, it's got to be accessible. Uh, at Monroe, we have one of the largest um, deaf populations in the United States in our area um, because of RIT and, and NTID. Um, so we've got to make sure that all of these tools that we're putting out there are accessible for all those students. Um, and that just makes it a friendly place all the way around for everybody, every single student. Um, so using the LMS for more than just delivering content for courses and assessing content and getting students engaged in the course, the non-curricular learning that happens in a college can be just as important. Where we learn everything is what happens in the halls and, and, and that's really what we're trying to do and that's what we try to do in discussion groups uh, and not just discussion groups in classes. Discussion groups, we could be talking about parking. We could be talking about a lot of other things that happen because they talk about a lot of those things in the hallways of the school. You know, and just is just a way to replicate that in a virtual campus. One of the problems we have with retention um, is that students in online courses and online programs don't really uh, have an affili uh, affiliation with the, the, the college they went to. I know for my, I would do an online program and I really couldn't tell you much about the college that I went to for the online program and I could tell you a whole lot about Nazareth College of Rochester where I lived and breathed for four years. Um, so yeah, you do, it does give you an opportunity to create that branding, if you will, or the identity, the students can I then, you know, say back, I, would, I did go to MCC, I did go to Monroe. Resources are um, really very tight right now. What we look at is really innovative ways, bringing on faculty. We've brought on faculty to come and give us hours in the form of being program coordinator time, release time, um, getting them on board. We have a distance ed series that's a faculty-led series. We offer that monthly and we get the faculty involved talking at a higher level conversation. Not just talking about the features of online, but what does it mean to teach online. So really that's our focus now, two things. Bringing the faculty on board to help support us and also looking at the learning management system as a as an equalizer, so getting faculty, maybe not to teach online, but at least using the digital world through the learning management system. So much in the works, all takes time, resources, people, but that's the vision.